Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSB Magazine. You're listening to a new The Hacker Factory podcast with hacker maker, Philip Wiley. You're about to discover what the role of a professional hacker entails, the different specializations it holds, and what it takes to learn and become one. Enjoy the conversation as Philip and guests unveil the secrets of professional hacking, a mysterious, intriguing, and often misunderstood occupation. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hacker Factory Podcast. I'm your host, the hacker maker, Philip Wiley. In each episode, I have a unique story from my guests that will hopefully resonate with you and help inspire you on your journey into offensive cybersecurity. In this episode, I'm really happy to introduce my friend, Jason Haddix. We met while I was an ambassador at Bug Crowd. I followed Jason for a while. That's really what got me interested in Bug Bounty because he had some really cool things that he was doing that helped me as a web app pen tester. So that's how I originally found out about Jason. And then we got to know each other while I was a Bug Crowd ambassador. So welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks for having me, Phil. That's great to have you. So uh, for those of, that haven't heard of you, uh, we have a lot of people that are just getting started. Could you tell our listeners a little about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Jason. Um, so extensively, I've been doing security stuff for about, I would say, 15 years. Um, some of it being paid for by companies, other times not. But, <laughs> um, you know, it just depends on where you are. Uh, I started as a in IT, basically, as a help desk technician. So I always like to tell people who are just starting their journey, right, you can do anything um, from anywhere, right, in this industry. It's one of the things I love about security is, um, you know, so many people come into it from, you know, like graduating college with a communications degree, uh, no IT experience, you know, or whatever, and and eventually, you know, end up being world-renowned researchers or, or something, right? It's just when this, this thing comes a call in, you know it, you feel it, and you know you really kind of put your all into it. And so, uh, yeah, I started in help desk at um, Citrix, um, Citrix, Citrix Systems, which had a satellite office in Santa Barbara, which is where I grew up, when, where I went to college. And um, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I worked help desk there um, for a long time, and I went to a city college um, in my town, Santa Barbara City College. And they had some electives as part of the certified net networking um, path, the Cisco certified networking path. And one of them was called Ethical Hacking and Network Defense. Um, and I took this class because I thought it sounded cool. And I was you know, learning switching and routing at the time, like trying to be like a real IT person uh, while I was in help desk, trying to like you know, further my stuff. And uh, the class was not super great, uh, but it did introduce me to the fact that you could do what's called penetration testing for a living. That was like a job that you could do. And um, so I got kind of obsessed. And um, I ended up, since I was on the night shift for help desk, uh, you know, I was working from like 7 p.m. to 8 a.m. or something like that. And um, I ended up spending all my free time when I wasn't on calls, uh, just researching and doing everything I could to figure out, you know, like, how did you do How do you do this pen testing thing? What's it about? And um, so I, you know, I spent some time there working with the local IT I brought them some some web security bugs that I had identified, some cross-site scripting, which I didn't really know what I was doing, honestly, at the time. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just putting some characters into a field and seeing if something pops up, right? And so, like, I brought them some cross-site scripting bugs, and they were like, cool. And then, uh, you know, I had a relationship with the security group at Citrix, which was really cool. Um, and then I left Citrix to be part, uh, to be a junior pen tester, um, you know, a year later at a small consultancy called Redspin, stayed there for a few years, moved on to be a, a senior web tester there, specializing in web. Uh, and then um, I went to HP, where I was a consultant for two years, um, and then moved on to be the director of the penetration testing group at HP, which was probably one of the biggest teams I've managed. Um, 
it was the HP team that did all of the pen tests for all of HP's clients as a, you know, as a consultancy. Um, and then we eventually acquired Fortify, which did static source code analysis. So we ended up branching out into source code analysis and mobile assessment and you name it, we did it. It was crazy. And I built a lot of my industry knowledge at that time um, at HP, working with some crazy smart people. Um, and then, uh, and then after that, I uh, left and went to Bug Crowd for another five years, five year stint where um, I ran operations. I designed uh, a lot of the product stuff. Um, I did a little bit of everything at Bug Crowd, um, but also interacted with the researchers. And during that time, I was a researcher myself on Bug Crowd, so I did a lot of bug bounty. I used my pen test skills to make some money and hack some stuff there. Um, and now I am the head of security uh, at Ubisoft, the video game company. So that's kind of uh, where where I've been over throughout my career. So before you got went to work for Bug Crowd, I know you, of course, you had the web pen testing, web app pen testing skills and stuff. Did you were you doing Bug Bounty before you uh, went to work for Bug Crowd? Yeah. So um, before I went to work with Bug Crowd, I was uh, I was doing Bug Bounty for like maybe a year, I think, before I left HP, um, you know, as a, you know, like one of the inspirations for me when I was uh, kind of coming up in the pen testing scene was Dan Kaminsky, right? He's such a smart dude and, um, you know, not with us anymore, unfortunately. I mean, he was a, uh, an acquaintance, uh, not really like a super friend, but an acquaintance of mine. And, um, you know, he was the director of pen testing at IOActive um, for a long time. And uh, so that's what kind of modeled me after being the role I wanted to be at HP. But it included a lot of stuff that wasn't just research. It was also like minutia of management, right? And so, um, and so like, you know, if 50% of your time is dedicated to the minutia of management and then another 50% of your time is, you know, developing methodology training and working with the team, uh, there's, you know, I wasn't doing a ton of pen tests, right? Um, or, or hacking. And so bug crowd, the bug bounty stuff allowed me to continue to let me use my skills and do research in my free time. And so I did that for about a year. Um, and I was number one on the leaderboard for a couple years when bug crowd first came out. Now I'm like, you know, like 40th overall in some categories or something like that. Cause I don't get to do it as often, but I'm still pretty up there. Um, you know, I hacked a lot of companies. Uh, it was a lot of fun back in the early days of Bug Bounty, and uh, it was it was pretty cool. So, do you feel like the the Bug Bounty experience helped you as a web app pen tester? Oh yeah, for sure. So, <clears throat> you know, when I came up uh, doing uh, doing pen tests at Redspin and and then through HP, um, you know, usually it's a scoped engagement, right? You have one domain. Uh, you know, you're not really looking at um, not really looking at subdomains or anything like that. And then when Bug Bounty came out, it was more of a different deal. It was more holistic where you could look at the whole scope of a company, right? You could look at subdomains and you could look at like, you know, virtual hosted apps and stuff like that on the same domain. And so, um, yeah, so it gave you a lot more opportunity to stretch your recon skills. And so I was one of the first people to kind of share my recon methodology uh, in the early days of Bug Bounty. And so like I, I did several presentations on, you know, how I do recon to find esoteric like subdomains and, um, you know, acquisitions of companies and uh, finding bugs on those types of sites and stuff like that. So that was, uh, that was a, a good opportunity to do stuff a little bit differently. So, yeah, as far as I know, you, you do some, some mentoring and teaching and I know you've done some, some, uh, courses and stuff where you're helping people get started in the industry. If you, yep. if you would mind sharing some of that experience with us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, really my, my classes are not super big, honestly. Um, I started out with um, some friends of mine who were veterans coming, coming back home from deployment in Afghanistan uh, many years ago. And that was my first class. And uh, we were gaming buddies. We were buddies in high school, um, and they came back and they were really struggling to kind of find out where, um, you know, where they fit. You know, what career they were going to choose. And you know, I told them if they were willing to dedicate, you know, the time to learn, I would teach them, and they could try to find some stuff in security or, or IT if I could, you know, help them at all. I would. And uh, so we started. I started working on the first iteration of this course. 
um, which is just called AppSec Bootcamp, really generic name. And um, it's really focused on getting them into, getting people into web testing. And so it, <clears throat> it starts off with some prerequisites, right? I think any anybody this day and age who is, um, you know, who is willing to put in the effort can probably do some Code Academy courses, right? So there's some prerequisites of a couple Code Academy courses, which is mostly how to build and operate a website, right? Like the core language is HTML, um, JavaScript, and then one other language. Usually people choose Python. Um, and they do the introductory courses there on Code Academy before they even start training with me. Um, and then also how to you know use a VPS, a uh, little bit of the command line module on Code Academy, um, just so that they can set up their own VPS and box when we start doing some testing. And then well, once they finish the prereqs, we start. It's usually about a six to seven month class, um, and we go chapter by chapter through the Web Application Hackers Handbook, which I think is the de facto resource for anybody learning web hacking. Um, it explains. You know, most, if not all, of the categories of vulnerabilities. Um, and what we do is we take a vulnerability class and we learn about it uh, over a week or two weeks, basically. And so um, we'll take the chapter as reading from the Web Application Hackers Handbook, and then we'll take uh, we'll take all of these broken web applications that exist out in the wild, all these CTF apps and stuff like that. Um, and I'll make I, I pick like you know usually ten to fifteen of the bug class, and I make them. Uh, do it kind of as if it was a bug bounty, right? So first of all, I make them stand up the apps. Usually, they're they have to stand up their own vulnerable app, right? They're not they're not allowed to do the courses that are already stood up on the internet, like um, like uh, you know the Port Swigger One WebSec Academy, right? I'm talking about things like WebGoat and you know stuff like that, where they're going to get a little bit of experience too from standing up all these esoteric web servers and stuff like that and getting them to work. That's part of like the trial by fire, and so uh, they set up the server. And then they solve the challenge, you know, the challenges that I direct them to. And then they do a write-up on the vulnerability and kind of why it's impactful and how they found out to do it. And um, they submit like a little findings report. And they do about 10 to 15 of those per vulnerability classes over the course of two weeks, usually two to three weeks. Um, and we go over all of the big web vulnerability classes. Usually ones like cross-site scripting take a little bit of less time. Uh, other ones like SQL injection that have concepts of like some database stuff take a little bit longer. Um, you know, insecure direct object reference is one that is actually usually shorter because it just makes a lot of sense from people coming in, like understanding what that is. Um, Server side request forgery and you know template injection and all these other ones. Those ones take a little bit longer, um, and we just work through them. And then uh, we we meet for about we were meeting in those classes for probably like. I'd say an hour a night, three nights a week, I think, in my in my first iterations of the classes. Um, but I haven't done one for a little while. COVID has kind of put a little bit of a of a stop on the on the classes. And so um yeah, that's that was kind of the the gist of what I was doing with uh, my students. Yeah, it's pre pretty interesting. I remember talking to you back then. You kind of recommended for people starting out to start out with web app opposed to other areas of yeah. of pen testing. Yeah. yeah. I think um I think everybody uses the web right so some of the the core concepts are easy to understand for for people. Um also I think it's where the most opportunity is to get started nowadays, right? You can be a I mean you can be a network pen tester, right? But there's honestly these days I feel like there's more opportunity jobs wise in the web space and the mobile space and um, because like, you know, the, the days of service level vulnerabilities where you were going to probably scan with a vulnerability scanner or a port scanner like Nmap and find an open port and then be able to exploit that directly. A lot of that's gone these days, right? Like there's not a lot of, you know, server side, uh, or service level exploits anymore. Um, and so like, you know, NetPen was something that I learned and I started with and I loved and, you know, I've used Metasploit so much, I, you know, I can't even tell you. Um, but you know, the, the evolution of net pen has become red teaming. Right. And so, uh, red teaming is, you know, has a lot of stuff in it that are complex windows, internal fundamentals that people need to know. And I just feel like for new people learning web is just a little bit easier. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's going back to the network penetration testing. A lot of times the web app stuff is very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's been a lot of pen tests I've been on 
you know, I can recall several that were like a pat had Apache Tomcat with either default or weak credentials and yep. you're able to upload a malicious war file. Yep. E- even like an Apache J boss. So it seems like a lot of times there's more opportunity there. And, you know, a lot of these tools to manage it functions and different security software use some kind of Java, Java server. And, and yep. so sometimes there's vulnerabilities there. Yeah. I mean, I remember being on, on uh, NetPen projects, right? Like at HP or Redspin, right? And they give you a, you know, normally when you're given a pen test, they give you an IP range, right? And they're like, scan these, scan these IPs for vulnerabilities, right? And even then it was starting to become like slim pickings. There weren't a lot of like, you know, internet accessible exploits that you were looking for that you could find. And so when you would find a web server, you would just kind of extend your test into web testing, you know, and a lot of times you would find control panels like that, right, or back end stuff, or you'd find them running a, you know, some type of uh, authentication panel for some app on a, like a high web port or something like, or on a high port that was, you know, hosting web servers, or something like that. So, um, you know, it always used to be one of those things where your boss would get mad at you, right? You would do doing the pen test and you're scanning the range and you don't find anything remotely exploitable, but then you found a web app and you start going to work on the web app and your boss would be like, you're not, they're not paying for a web app test, like stop. And you just, as a hacker, you just want to go, you know, you like found it and you want to hit it and you want to show value. And uh, I, I remember some of those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I think that was, I think that's good because at least that way you're able to show some value because when you get on those pen tests, sometimes that otherwise, if you didn't find something like that, there wouldn't be that many findings in the report. So at least that way, at least that way the customer sees that you did something with your time. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of as far as online as people getting started, I watched uh, one of your streams recently with Naham Sek and you were doing the, the, uh, doing the resume yeah. tips and stuff that was pretty impressive is there anything you know maybe some tips you could share here with people that are wanting to to build a good resume or things yeah. that they can use to show experience yeah so uh so ben uh Nahamsek on um twitter and twitch um he's a friend of ours um he had me on to talk about you know like building a resume and using your bug bounty experience on your resume to get a job because uh, as cool as it sounds to be a full-time bug hunter, it's it's hard. It's really, really hard to do it full-time. And very few people do it full-time, full-time without having a day job. A day job hacking is, you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of security in that and stuff like that. So um, yeah, so we talked about like, you know, what, you know, what we would look for on a resume and how to integrate your bug bounty experience and if it was valid at all. And the first answer to the question is, you know, if you have some bug bounty experience, uh, yeah, it's absolutely relevant to put it on your your resume, right? Like the the ultimate test of someone's, you know, like resolve in hacking is if you can actually probably hack like a live site, you know, or at least like you've had some experience testing a live, you know, real web app um, instead of some of the broken, purposefully broken ones you can do in a lab environment. And so if you have bug bounty experience, you know, you can integrate it right into like, you know, the experience section, you know, of your of your resume. And you can go watch that video exactly like how we placed it and stuff like that if you've had some success. But if you haven't and you're newer, um, you can still use the same principle with the broken web applications that, you know, we talked about on the stream. And so, that, you know, nowadays there are so many. Um, so there's a project called the OWASP Broken Web Applications Directory Project. And I don't know if it's still maintained, but it kind of doesn't matter because it's got about like, I think like 60 um, or 50 maybe uh, different broken web applications that uh, people have built over the years to demonstrate vulnerabilities, mostly web vulnerabilities. Um, And you can basically stand these up. They're mostly hosted on GitHub. So you grab the code, host it on your server, and uh, and then go through all of the challenges. And one of the ones that, you know, I used to use a lot was BWAP and, you know, it's one of the more ancient ones is WebGoat, but now there's Juice Shop and like all these other ones. And so, um, so you can integrate those right onto your resume as well, right? In, in the absence of having any work experience, you know, I have uh, students right now, actually, who are building their resumes right now, who are or one of my guys who took my class a long time ago, switching jobs, and he has to refresh his resume. And so he's done all the WebSec Academy classes uh, that Port Swigger, Port Swigger made. Uh, he's also done um, Juice Shop and BWAP, and um, he's done some Hack the Box, and he's done 
try hack me and he's done some other stuff too and it's just like a block in the skill section of the resume about like what what things he's completed um so he uses all those names he says i've completed these uh sections of those and also they represent a body of work of understanding the beginnings of these types of vulnerabilities and then he lists the types of vulnerabilities he's <clears throat> he's done before so cross-site scripting, SQL injection, you know, all of the, the classics and web. Um, and that block, you know, takes up about an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches on your resume page. But for someone who doesn't have much more, much experience getting into it, at least me as someone who's looking to hire someone on a red team or, uh, you know, a, an assessment team or something like that. And that tells me that they've done the work. They've done kind of the homework to like, you know, get started and and stuff like that, and they have some some familiarity with the vulnerabilities, which is a, a good stepping stepping to stone towards like doing the actual job. So. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting and, and great idea, you know, because most of the time people throw a bunch of tools or different operating systems they use on there, and really don't show what they do with that. So right. that's, a, that's a great way. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. My next big talk is actually not a. A hacking technical talk. Oh, it is, but I have two in the in the uh, in kind of the works right now. My next one is actually more along your veins, Phil, which is uh, it's more of a kind of series of talks to get people into to hacking, right? Like I think helping people find their way into this and um, being as happy as I am in security, right? Like I want I want people to I want people to uh, to experience that, and so. Um, I broke it down into several sections, right? It's not just, you know, how you do your resume and it's not just, you know, um, the skills that you need to do the job. There's other components into finding, uh, into like getting the job, right? And the first thing is to understand about the industry, right? Like who are the players in this industry? Like what can you do with these skills? What jobs are you qualified to do? What are the salaries for these types of jobs that you're looking at? where do you find the jobs once you've decided you wanted to do this and you've built up the skills like how do you go about finding all of the um the open you know requisites you can't just go to linkedin right there's a lot of really good resources out there to help you find um to help you find jobs and then how do you interview for a job like this are you expected to do a practical interview where they're going to put you on the spot to hack a website and what might you see on a practical interview what might they ask you for the interview how do you negotiate your salary when you've passed the interview. So I had this series of talks that's going to be um, from like zero to hero on getting into the, you know, kind of the hacking job, uh, if you will. And I don't know what I'll talk, I don't know what I'm gonna call it yet, but I'm super excited for it. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. That's one, one of the things that's been missing for years is some of the things how to get in, you know, there's all this information on there on how to do web app pen testing or pen yeah. testing, but the prerequisites and all that stuff. And then I like that you added the career piece to it. That's yeah, that's a yeah. missing piece there too. Yeah, I think it's also it's also uh, it gives a little bit of perspective too about what the job is going to be like, right? Uh, a lot of people, you know, fantasize about having this job, you know, the hacking job, and they don't actually know what it's going to look like when they get their first one and what you're going to be doing. And you know, a lot of times at some, you know, if you're a consultant, you're traveling, right? And people don't take that into account, right? Sometimes you're going to be traveling to do network pen tests, internal pen tests, you know, if you're new at it, or, you know, you, you might be somewhat attached to like the conference circuit for some reason, or you might have to do X, Y, and Z. And like, uh, so uh, giving a good representation of what you do day to day, uh, and how long it takes, and then like, you know, talking about things like reporting, which people don't often think about when they're just getting started, like how much time you spend doing reporting, and how much critical writing is part of your job, um, I think uh, helps prepare people to understand what the lifestyle is like when you get into it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, pen testing out of everything seems to be the most interesting, but yeah. I think when people get to find out how much report writing is involved, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe yeah. less interesting to them. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so if you, if you let them know up front, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they can prepare or build some of those skills or, you know, maybe they find out it's not for them. Who, who knows? I remember, I remember back in the day, we didn't have a lot of, you know, kind of like the Drotus like frameworks where you could build a report pretty modularly and quickly. 
Um, and so we just had templates, you know, we had open office templates or word templates and, you know, copy and pasting, finding, you know, findings in and, um, and reporting, you know, if you have a week long pen test, depending on where you are, you might only get actually three or four days of hacking and then one day spent on reporting. Uh, if you're at a really good shop, you get the full five days of hacking if uh, if the pen test is a week, right? And then you get the next following week for reporting. But uh, it all depends on where you are and, you know, knowing you know, knowing those things going into it and what can make you more effective in your job or, or some of the other things I want to cover in the class too, so. Yeah, that, that goes back to where you're talking about doing the write-ups when you're going through on your resume to, yep. you know, work on the different vulnerable VMs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so very good. I look forward to that coming out and sharing that those, that those videos that you're coming out with. I think it's going to be very, very helpful. Hopefully, hopefully it will be. Yeah. <laughs> so what is some other advice that you would give to someone that was wanting to get started in the industry? You know, there's, there's so much available now. Um, and it can be, uh, you can get overwhelmed by the amount of like e-learning and YouTube videos and stuff that's, that's out there. Um, I, what actually is the, the complaint I get a lot from new people is I used to hear when I was associated to bug crowd and like all the new bug bounty hunters, right. Is that, uh, there was almost too much, right? Like you, they were trying to tackle everything at one time and that is not feasible. It's why I structure my class one vulnerability at a time. Right. And then like, uh, we hit edge cases like, you know, later on or, or something like that. And it's, um, you know, pick a topic, right. Pick. You know, you know, if you're doing web application penetration testing and that's something you want to do, um, you know, start with one topic like cross-site scripting or SQL injection and, you know, spend a good month or a month and a half just learning that vulnerability, right, really well. I mean, you have the core fundamentals of why it exists. You have the ways to exploit it. Um, you have, you know, you know, several high, uh, what am I? What am I trying to say here? Some uh, very high, you know, or at least public examples of how it happened to like a real, you know, website, you know, like Netflix or, you know, something like that, or, um, you know, understand like where you look for it. I think that's a lot of, I think that's a lot of context that's lost these days too, is, um, you know, people will tell you to learn this stuff, you know, SQL injection or cross-site scripting or anything, right? And, and in a lab environment, you usually know right where the vulnerability is. Um, and so when you get to working though, you have no idea, like a, <laughs> like an enterprise level web application can have something like hundreds to thousands of, of inputs and you have no idea where the vulnerability is. Right. And so learning about the places where the vulnerability is most likely to represent itself for each class of vulnerability is also something I really harp on my students to learn, um, to understand like, you know, okay, these forms in the account section are all interacting with the database, right? Because they have to store your personal information. And when you make updates to it, they're going to the database eventually. So these are places where SQL injection is most likely to happen. They're also very common since uh, since it's going to display your own information back to you, the account section of this website is also probably you know, the place where you want to look for cross-site scripting, you know? And, and so understanding like how web apps work contextually and where to find the vulnerabilities, I think is a, is a good, it's a good teaching tool for, for new kids and new, your new students to get into uh, kind of the art, I think. So. Very cool. Yeah. So we're getting down towards the end of the show. And so if there, is there anything that you would like to, to discuss or any shout outs you'd like to give? Um, you know, there's a, there's a ton of people, I think, uh, out there creating content, but I would say, you know, if you have only so much time, um, you know, Ben Nahamsek is a, is a good one to watch, right? He creates really good content. Um, and has a lot of guests just like you do, Phil, who talk about their hacking experience or who talk about bug bounties. And you can really learn a lot from listening to his past streams on YouTube. Um, I would say go through your past talks where you talked about hacking, kind of the education cycle of, uh, of becoming a hacker, right? Uh, the talk you did at, um, uh, what con was that we were at together? Um, that was... Uh, was it... B-Sides Austin? B-Sides Austin, yeah. 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 Uh, the idea that, you know, if you want to get into the newer fringe technologies, you can look at trainings that are going on at like Black Hat or DEF CON or 
whatever. Like that's a tip I've told people before and you had it in your talk. I was so happy someone else thought of it um, is that, you know, go look at what people are talking about, you know, for thousands of dollars worth of training at SANS and you can reverse engineer, you know, uh, any one of those skills and find the free information on the internet. So you can, uh, you can go look in that, but uh, yeah, for content creators, I would say Ben yourself, um, Stoke, uh, who's another content creator does, um, weekly kind of blast outs of InfoSec news. Um, and those, those ones will keep you busy. Daniel Meisler does a general InfoSec, um, uh, InfoSec newsletter that will keep you kind of abreast of what's going on in the larger security scene, not just the hacky hacking scene. Um, and so like, if you want to like curate your inputs, I would say those three or four people will keep you kind of up to date and give you a lot of cool stuff to, um, to read and listen to over the course of your week. Um, and then, yeah, the, the two that I would say for new people that are absolutely must do's are WebSec Academy was a game changer for a lot of people. Um, Support Swigger, the people who make Burp have WebSec Academy. I'm sure you've talked about it before in your, on your episodes and with some of your students. The labs there like are really, really good labs and they're free. So that's awesome. Um, Bug Crowd University and Hacker 101 have education topics and videos for all the vulnerabilities um, that are free. Pentester Labs is another one I really like. Um, they're an online uh, online um, uh, kind of challenge, uh, hacking challenge uh, sites. And then um, Hack the Box as well is really good. And so like, uh, you know, just keep banging your head away and, you know, you, you get there eventually. So. Actually had Louis from uh, Pentester Lab on here as a guest. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. How did that was that was good. I, I I got to hang out with Louis. I think last year for the first time, it was super fun. We had many beers. <laughs> it, it was great talking to him. And one of the things I do like is that he tries to help people. And a lot of times when he does his giveaways, he tries to find underrepresented people. Yeah. And you know, this is not only just race or gender. This type of thing, just globally. So I really like that he he he's doing that. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Louis is, is a cool, cool dude. <laughs> also, too, if, as far as content goes, that you was mentioned, you were mentioned Web Security Academy by Portswigger. Someone else that has some good content is Rana Khalil. Oh, really? Yeah, she actually. I first found out about her when she did a uh, some write ups on the OSCP. Okay. She kind of did that for herself to be able to have notes. Nice. And then she went on and she does a series on YouTube using Port Swigger Web, App, Web Application Security Academy. And mm -hmm. she does walk through on all the vulnerabilities. She'll go through, Very walk cool. through it. She's got long videos into shorter videos. And she'll even show you how to solve things using like Python. Nice. That's very cool. Um, we had, there was another guy too that I really liked. Uh, this one, not a lot of people talk about. But so one of the old broken web app projects that used to be out there was um, uh, Matilde. And it had, uh, multiple challenges for people to do for all the different web stuff. And there was a guy named uh, Jeremy Druin on um, on YouTube who used to do the same thing. He uh, he has YouTube str or small snips of uh, each challenge, solving each challenge, using the common tools you would use to solve the challenge. So it's a good like zero to kind of finished uh, view of, of, you know, walking through some of those vulnerabilities in like Burp Suite and stuff like that. And so... Uh, I watched a lot of those, and I, I also do recommend them in my class. I think they're somewhere in the syllabus for people. Um, and then Sam Bone, uh, have you have you talked to Sam yet? No, I haven't. That's I'm glad you, you mentioned that. You should get Sam on this show. Actually, <laughs> Sam is amazing. Uh, so Sam Bone is a, a acquaintance of mine. I would say friend. We've we've met several times, and I've been out to his class. Um, but Sam runs the ethical hacking classes at San Francisco City College. Um, and, um, he got a blank check to write his own curriculum. So he wrote the class very similar to what I did. He wrote a class on web application hacking, wireless hacking, network pen testing. So he created a curriculum for hackers at the city college, um, for the web one, he used the web application hackers handbook and, uh, all of his lectures and his homework assignments for his students that go through these classes are all public every year. He, pub he uh, keeps them public on his on his website, I think it's samclass.info. And um, and you can find uh, some great people have stopped by there to talk. He records it. Um, and it's actually like a structured university class on learning how to hack, which is absolutely 100% free, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I actually found out about him before I started teaching. He was kind of uh, 
an inspiration on, on how things should be done. But what else is cool about Sam too, for our listeners that haven't heard of Sam is Sam routinely teaches at black hat too. So he does. Yeah. Not yeah, only, I mean, you know, he's on the con scene for uh, all kinds of talks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's some, that's some real, real street cred there when you can go to a hacker conference and you're teaching these courses, because sometimes in the universities and colleges, it's a lot of theory and they don't really have the yeah. hands-on experience, but Sam's pretty awesome. Yeah. All of his stuff is super fresh too. He's, he's integrating new techniques and stuff all the time, which is really cool. Yeah. I have to definitely reach out to Sam. So thanks for, for bringing Sam up. Yeah, no problem. So thank, thanks for joining me. It's been great listening to, to your story and the, the uh, knowledge and inst- advice that you've shared. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, uh, I'm glad that I came on and uh, hopefully I'll come on again. That'd be great. Yeah, it'd be awesome. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks everyone. Bug Crowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hacker Factory podcast with Philip Wiley. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.